Welcome to today's episode of Euromed Migration Talks, a web series dedicated to migration in the Euro-Mediterranean region, run by the Euromed Migration 4 project implemented by ICMPD. I'm your host, Marco Ricorda, and today I will be accompanied by Maria Pisani, Senior Lecturer at the University of Malta and the Co-Founder and Director of the Integra Foundation. Maria, how are you today? I'm good, how are you? Not so bad. And I'd like to ask you a few questions about your work and your research. Now, to uh, something that uh, fascinated me about, uh, about some of your publication is that uh, in your research, you often use the expression homo migratus <laughs> to speak about migration as a natural phenomenon, uh, arguing that human beings uh, have always migrated and always will be. However, over the last uh, few years, the public debate seems to focus more, uh, mainly on the negative side of, of migration. Now, what are your thoughts on that? Mm. The term homo migratus was something that I came up with, in a, I think, in a, in a moment of boredom, in, 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 in truth. But, but it was to, to, to capture an incredibly important point. And that is that as long as human beings have walked on this earth, we have migrated. This, we are all the produce, um, the product of, of migration. Um, so this is nothing new. And I, and I think it helps to, to frame the conversation around the hugely diverse ways people migrate. Um, also, I, I think I'd like to start by challenging the notion of problem as well. Like perhaps we can speak about the challenges that arise as a result of migration. Again, couched within a much broader context as well, rather than problems per se. Very good. And those on the move are arguably the key, as we say in Latin, dramatis persona in this so-called crisis. And yet their voices are often absent in uh, dominant representations of it. Now, uh, what would be your advice to ensure the uh, heterogeneity of their stories uh, could have a place in the debate? What would you recommend? Okay, so Marco, you're focusing, I think, on a particular um, movement when you use the term crisis. I think you're referring perhaps to the Mediterranean region specifically. Um, That's correct. Because obviously the, the issue of migration is much, much broader than that. But most of my work has focused on the Mediterranean region and the central Mediterranean route in particular. Um, the question of crisis, though, is, is an interesting one. Um, if you look at the loss of life, avoidable loss of life in the Mediterranean, yes, I, I'd say there is a humanitarian crisis, but an avoidable one. Um, at the end of the day, people cross the Mediterranean Sea because they have no safe or legal alternative. So I think it's important that we, we acknowledge this um, from, from the start off. In terms of voice and representation, um, as you rightly highlight, um, we can talk of, of mixed, to, uh, mixed flows, but I, I think in real terms, different people migrate and different people are forced to move for different reasons. And to homogenize the experience and the people that are traveling on the boats would be a, a huge mistake. Um, ongoing research has demonstrated the, the diverse experiences, but also common experiences as well. In terms of representation and voice, um, this has always been a challenge for me personally as Maria. Um, the risk in, in representing people and speaking on behalf of people who are crossing the Mediterranean um, well it comes with responsibilities and, and, and I always feel when I speak, I have to be very careful not to recolonize voices. But the reality also is that when people are dealing with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis and experiencing, if they're on a boat, then they cannot. They cannot speak on their behalf, which means that others with a huge sense of responsibility have to speak on their behalf. Um, in our work in Malta, we have tried um, to engage the refugee population and, and other migrants in Malta so that they might become a part of that conversation or be at the, at the front of that conversation um, as soon as they are ready and we provide as much support um, in order to, to, to see this through. Obviously, in terms of, of having voice, it also 
um, if I was to use the words of speak at, speak, speak back, um, it is not just will I be heard, but not, not just who, who, who has the right to speak, but also who will be heard. Um, and so it means in our work as an, as an academic and also as an activist in, in working with a number of different stakeholders, um, from policymakers to faith leaders to the media, um, to ensure that refugees' voices are heard in the very diverse platforms where they need to be heard and that their voices are, are, um, are given importance. Uh, very good. Um, now, let's uh, talk also about citizenship. Uh, in your research, you often discuss the role of citizenship in the migration debate, uh, speaking about citizenship as a state-sanctioned form of discrimination and devoking the place of the rights to, to rights in the discussion. Now, uh, could you explain what you mean in uh, using these terms? I come from a background in sociology of education um, and it when you're working in migration this might seem an obvious thing um, but given my background I became very aware of, of two issues first of all um, that we celebrate democracy um, as if it's a uncritically I would say um, and we almost assume that everyone has the right to rights. I mean, why wouldn't we? Um, this is the, 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 the narrative that we've been, that we've learned from day one. And it's only when you're working with migrants, particularly refugees, asylum seekers, and undocumented migrants, that you recognize, you begin to recognize, not only the, limits, the limitations of citizenship, but also the limitations of human rights, where ultimately, human rights are trumped by, if you'll excuse the, um, the term, by, by citizenship rights. Um, it's interesting, just recently I was looking at the history of, of voting rights in, in Malta, um, and it was just over 70 years ago that women were given the, the right to vote in Malta, and I believe 150 years ago, not long ago at all, um, the vast majority, the vast majority of men couldn't vote in Malta either, and there was a whole set of criteria. So we can look at um, the issue of citizenship first and foremost as yes, exclusionary, because not everybody can is is able to participate um, in what is ultimately one of the most important decision-making processes um, in any given nation state, but also how. Um, the rights that we take for granted as citizens are denied to those people um, that are also denied citizenship. Now, I'm, I'm speaking from Malta, um, where it is incredibly difficult for some people to be able to, to get citizenship. And yet, at the same time, we also sell citizenship. So citizenship becomes a commodity. Human rights have become a commodity. So I, I think it's hugely important that we raise questions and, and um, take certain, certain terms that, are, again, um, that I think we, we, we have learned to, to, to be uncritical, to, to take a very critical approach, um, always recognizing the historical perspective and how what we might assume to be natural and taken for granted today does have a historical legacy and, and has evolved over time. So even where we see re resistance um, to, to giving migrants or some migrants um, voting rights, um, well, there was the same resistance to women having voting rights and the same resistance to, to men, historically, recent history, having voting rights too. Uh, talking about uh, the importance of terms, I mean, there is an increasing negative and emotionally charged rhetoric around the term migrant. It's a term that raises attention on the use of labels, as of course labels can have a significant impact on the, dis the, the construction of the discourse. Uh, very often, the let's say the large the, the mainstream public uh, doesn't differentiate between a uh, migrant asylum seeker or refugee now in your opinion how important is the use of terminology in the migration debate hmm. well language is obviously very important um and and evolving 
as well. And different people use language in different ways. Um, so again, we can look at how the term migrant has evolved historically. If I look at Malta, um, we were historically a country of emigration. Um, the, many, the majority of Maltese people have, have family members living abroad. These were migrants. Um, but when we use the term migrant in this sense, from a Maltese perspective, it's not deemed as problematic. Um, we can use other terms such as expats that tend to be celebrated. And then the term immigrant. I differentiate in Malta between immigrant and migrant. And the term immigrant or immigrant has become synonymous with illegality, crime, the need to defend, um, and this is hugely problematic. Um, I like to, to refer to securitization theories and we can look at how language um, has, has been used in a very particular way um, to construct the notion of invasion um, of threat and of threat by the other. And we can also look at how this other is also couched within a historical racialized um, discourse that has become um, very dangerous because language feeds into lived realities um, and people die as a, as a result. People are illegally detained as a result. People are living incredibly difficult lives as a result of the language that some people knowingly choose to use because this isn't an accident this is an intentional um, strategy if you like so terms such as illegal um, threat invasion they create fear they construct fear and this breeds division and violence in many forms now, my last question for you today is uh, about, uh, it's about communication. So your involvement in the field provides you with an opportunity to keep the, let's say, the uh, dialectic relationship between theory and practice alive. Uh, building on your experience, what is your advice to promote a better dialogue between academia and migration practitioners? So those who make actually migration policy. Well, I mean, ultimately, research provides the evidence base. Academics can provide the evidence base. And research, especially when we, we again, if we look at the, the broader context and the language that is being used and the, um, the passions, if you like, it's visceral. Um, the conversations around migration are visceral. Um, and so the need for, um, yes, emotional debate, but, but, but um, an evidence-based debate is it comes to the fore and i think academia has an incredibly important role in this regard to to cut through the noise if you like and um to look at the different perspectives um i always take the refugee perspective and the migrant perspective to, to the fore um, but to look at the different voices and the different stakeholders involved um and and to sit down and and dialogue and embrace the uncomfortable conversations. They, they are uncomfortable conversations, um, but they are unavoidable. Maria Pisani, thank you very much for staying with us today. Um, it was a real pleasure to, uh, to talk to you about this very sensitive and modern uh, topic, and we wish you all the best for the continuation of your work. Thank you, thank you for having me.